Okay, we stopped here at 666, but I need to go back because there's another trend being depicted here that is also in the Matthew timeline down here. Okay. But I haven't covered it yet. Up here in Luke at the 469, it says, You who will endure will gain your lives. The word gain here is kataomai. And it's a really funny word. It's transla it's the tra Greek translation for the word kana. And it's you pronounce the Q with a click in your up upper palate. Kana. Just like Al Qaeda. It's like kana. Alright. Kana is the verb that the woman used when she had her firstborn. The woman who was named Isha before she fell and after she fell and was, you know, believed in Adonai, Elokeinu Adonai Echad. Um, she became called Chuva. And Chuva named her firstborn Cain. The, the noun is Cain. And it means spear. And it's a sexual pun. She was speared, so she gives birth to a spear. And that's how you acquire something. You spear a fish, you spear an animal. So it comes to mean acquire. And it's somewhat Hebraistically used here because, of course, you're acquiring your soul, acquiring your life. Sukkas means soul, literally. Um, by enduring in the doctrine and if you're spearing doctrine. In other words, it's it's, it's another way of the Bible does this a lot. As it were, God makes love to you through Bible doctrine. All right? It's the way of having so-called fellowship with him. But the whole marriage analogy starting in Genesis is an analogy between the marriage of God and creation when you believe in him. You know, the Lord is your husband. We are bride of Christ. That analogy never quits. And so it's being kind of made here. If you're married to scripture, you will know to count the syllables, and you will know what time it is there for, and you will know to get out before the 469 hits, because you were already warned back up here, okay, especially up here, they'll, they'll hand you over, okay, and the brothers will fight the brothers, and I covered that, this is the exact period when the sons of Constantine basically created civil war all over the Roman Empire, over whether God was one or three, with each other, killing each other eventually, and um, killing everybody in their kingdom. It was the so-called first of the many holy wars, and that's why you die, okay? And that was the warning back up here, and it was 203 to show Temple Down, same syllable count as in Isaiah, which um, Daniel 9 also used in his prayer, creating a second timeline out of that, linking that up to the man of time, bringing the timeline down to 238 B.C. when Daniel did it. And Mary picks up that timeline when she does her meter. Okay, so Luke, of course, who builds his whole gospel around her meter, expects you to know Daniel's meter, too. So when he packages what the word says, and this is indirect discourse, it looks like, where he's reminding you really of what Matthew said, but he's using some of the key words, but a lot of the time he's just, he's paraphrasing rather than actually quoting. And he might be actually quoting because the Lord would have said this more than once. Okay, you know, because he traveled around on a circuit, and during this last year that he knows he's going to be on earth, he's giving them, you know, the blessing. That was what you always did when you were going to die, is you gave a prophetic blessing. That started with Jacob. Okay, actually it started with, yeah, it started with Jacob. It might have started with Abraham, but I don't remember if there's a prophetic blessing by Abraham in the Bible. But that's what he's doing. So everybody knows, he knows, and he's basically telling them, I'm going to die, and I'm giving you your prophetic blessing, which is, 
you know, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen after I die. So they, they, they would have known to read it this way. Okay, so then if this is 203 and Temple is down, then why is this suddenly a 49? 49 was the cause of Temple Down. 49 was also the number of years after Temple Down for the, get this, rebuilding. Daniel prays in the 49th year after the Temple went down. See, Luke is tracking Daniel. He wants you to know he's using Daniel specific numbers, Isaiah 53 specific numbers, so that you know exactly what he's talking about. And of course, the text is talking about this too. I mean, the whole impetus for this is about the buildings of the temple. To Yehu. Here. You, you end up saying, yeah. But you're supposed to do a little rough breathing here. Here. Who. Genitive case for the temple. All right, so the whole thing is about the temple because, you know, the temple, the temple depicts is now gone, going home. And what's the temple that's going to be built after him? Well, its name is church. And any Jew who believes in Christ or in church is, you know, gets all the privileges of church just like any Gentile who believed in Christ during the age of the Jews got to have all the privileges of being a Jew, even if you weren't racially the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My guess is everybody on the planet now has some of those genes in him. But I can't prove it. There's certainly enough justification for it, what with all of the traveling across the Levant over the centuries. But why is this suddenly a 49 after the 203? It means something's getting rebuilt. Something's getting ready to end its period so it can be rebuilt. Well, what the heck is that? At 469 plus 30 is 499 A.D. Well, I've been talking about the Byzantines all the way down here because the text is Jerusalem specific. Okay, but that's not all the territory in the world. Yeah, that's right. Because what happened by 499 A.D.? So we got 16 years here. This was 453 which is an additional 30, making it 483. Okay. And that is verse, it's a little hard because I formatted this for um, landscape mode. Okay, 483 minus 15. Okay, so 483 minus 10 is 473 AD. You know, because I'm subtract, I'm adding the 30 AD in there. Okay, by 473 AD, Rome West, Rome West is about to go down. So that's right here. O me apolete. So just me. Me apolete. Right there. It's 473. 474 is the word me. And then apo is two more syllables. So it's 473. Three, four, five, and right about here at Le, which is really interesting, considering what Apolete means, that's when Rome ceases to really be Rome in the West. That's when Odovacher takes over. Paul's meter ends just as Odovacher reaches the age of manhood. Okay? But the point you're going to see here is that that Western split, the split with the West, the two, there were, there were two Roman emperors that began earlier, and it's a question where you want to say it started earlier, um, definitely by 283, you could really say it started in 247, because you, after Decius you had the split with Valerian and his son, um, Gallienus, and Valerian ends up dying in Persia, and Gallienus got the West, and that was during the crisis of the third century, and Gallienus was friendly to the Christians. So all along in here, even though it's technically Temple Down, the Christians in the West were moving and moving and moving to the West because they were being persecuted so much in the East. 
okay? Valerian was virulently anti-Christian and, of course, anti-Jew. So anybody who really had a Bible and just wanted to study it would go into Gallienus' territory. And Gallienus was, you know, off again, on again with the Roman Senate. And finally, you know, he ends up dying. And then there's, you know, after him, you have a bunch of little, little fracases. Everybody and his brother wanted to be an emperor until finally Diocletian comes along in 283 from his own state line, which is right here. Paul benchmarks it too. 283. Okay? So once Diocletian comes into power, that paves the way for Constantine. And from 283 until 346 is Constantine and his sons. And by this point, actually Constans and Constantius, they all die in here. By here, that's when you had um, the really bad ones. The really bad Roman emperors like um, Honorius and Arcadius and the problem of Stilicho and Belisarius and all that stuff. So by 450, the rift is complete. But there were like puppet kings in the West. And the Goths had, and the Ostrogoths, they kept coming in and sacking Rome and getting more and more, you know, what do you want to call it, power. So that by this point, you start to have in the West, not only a split between the West and the East, but you start to have the growth of what we call now nation states. Because the tribes, the Goths, they got sort of civilized. They, came, they became very Romanized over their contacts and attempts to sack Rome. And they wanted what Rome had. They wanted that culture. They started to adopt that culture. So if you endured all of the fighting that went on, by 499, there's some, the, the, the sort of like bad times in the West, more or less ended, and you could start rebuilding. I'm not saying times were good, but relative to what went on before, and certainly sheltered now from the Byzantine Empire, which, you know, was successively, you know, eroding because it just didn't have enough fight in it to retake Italy, all right? So it started, you know, staying in, staying in what we would call the East because it was headquartered right there at the Dardanelles. Yeah, I think it's the Dardanelles. What we call Constantinople or what we call Istanbul today was its headquarters. Okay? So it was still going bad, but the West was starting to perk up. So now 49 is saying, okay, 49 years is up, there's a rebuilding going on. Well, it was still savage, okay? But that's when you have the time of Clovis, and he was a he was an interesting jerk, but he was a jerk. And he converts, to, he converts to the apostate early version of, of uh, Catholicism back then. They didn't really have what you could call popes. But they did have bishops of Rome. And Clovis in particular, you know, got married to a gal who was 18. And I'm, I'm not sure if she converted or she already was Catholic. But he ends up converting. And so then you start now having the precursor of the Merovingian dynasty. The Merovingian dynasty gives way because of the, the kind of analogous to Celtics, gives way to the Carolingian dynasty so that by 800, you're going to end up having um, our boy um, Charlemagne. But this is all just starting in here. So while the, before the Arabs get there and it's still the Byzantines, Okay, with the, with the whole Arab thing coming in really um, right about here. Okay, because they, they invade in 638, so I guess you could say more here, because 636 is when the actual battle occurs, when Jerusalem is besieged and they finally give in. You have a, a split in the trends of history. So this 49 is about the West. And that's why, see, you got a 126 up here that leads to a 203. And it's basically saying, hi, what's going to become, because, you know, Constantine moved Rome. Okay, 
Constantine moved Rome here. It finally got rebuilt by about um, 336, 346. It had been finished. Okay, and so he he didn't he wasn't staying in Western Rome anymore in Italy. Okay, he was staying in what we call Constantinople. All right. So this is basically about how the West goes, the East goes, the West moves East, and it goes steadily down and worse. Okay, so that's why we got a second 126 here, is we got the West is, Rome has lost its grip over the West. So the West starts to break up into tribes, and what are called here, you know, the ethnos, the nations. Alright, so the 126 here is basically saying, well, this is a really bad time for the East the Byzantines, and I already explained that much. But it also starts to be a particularly bad time for the West. Okay? Now, I don't know how much history you're aware of, but during this period, besides the fact that you have these tribes coalescing into what are co now called nations, all right, you also had a lot of missionary activity, and you also had a, 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 an increase in the number of monasteries. And what they did in monasteries was make copies of Bibles. They did a lot of different things, but primarily what they were doing is they were making copies of Bibles, and then depending on what kind of you know order of monks that they chose to establish, that was their way to sort of escape Rome, escape the papal see, escape all of the control, and in the name of being Catholic, they did whatever they wanted. And they had all kinds of different monasteries, and each one was, you know, probably still apostate, but they were making Bible copies, and they were learning Bible copies, and they were sending out missionaries to evangelize all these coalescing tribes. This is when you have Columba, who goes, you know, to Scotland, and all these other kinds of guys that were running around, okay? If you wanted to learn and live on Bible in those days, that's pretty much what you had to do. You had to either align yourself with a monastery, go work at a monastery, or be a monk. Or, you know, align yourself with some duke who could afford to order a copy of the Bible being printed. And then, you know, for the sake of his own inhabitants, he would have it taught. That's how things were done in those days. Well, 49 then means that there's some rebuilding, but it doesn't last long. It goes down the tubes here. But that doesn't last either because, see, this closes with the 91. 84 is God's decree. 91 means God's decree fulfilled. And then, it's, you know, the 14 again, you got seven more. Christ was supposed to be in his 98th year when the millennium was supposed to begin. So this has always got a good connotation. Purpose fulfilled. Okay, purpose fulfilled, but tribulation to follow, basically, because he was supposed to be in his 91st year when the tribulation was supposed to begin, had there been no church. Okay, but here it's not good. So, 595 plus 30, okay, if you want to know the benchmark timing in there. Okay, 595 plus 30 is 625 A.D. This is still before the Muslims. So 625 A.D., when you go look it up historically for the West, was a time of some turbulence. Okay, first of all, you had the problem with the plagues that occurred during Justinian. You know, and this is, this is actually the period of them, right here. And one of the reasons that you had those plagues um, was because Justinian himself was kind of what do you want to call it, uh, a bad guy, anti-Semitic, started, you know, all kinds of laws against the Jews, and you know, he was ma married to Theodora, there were some good things and bad things about him, but there were a lot of plagues that took place during his time, and he ends up going mad, okay, a lot of them did. So, this is kind of like the beginning of that, and then once you have plagues, you have a lot of people dying. Once you have a lot of people dying, you have the, the, the sort of like destruction of the economy. Okay, once you have the destruction of the economy, and of course this is still happening toward the east, 
once you have those things happen, well, you got a lot of people fleeing to the West. Okay? So it's a bad time in the West, too, because if you're busy fleeing, then you're losing your faith in God. So you're not learning and living on Bible, and you're sort of reverting into animalism. So it is a bad time in the West. All right? But somehow, somewhere, amidst all that horror, there's growth. Because here's a 21. 21 always means growth. It's it, The meaning derives from Jacob being 21 years under Laban and coming out with two families. And that's why 21 and 42 are always significant for growth. Because he comes out with two families. Okay, ha ha. And the other reason is because 616... And I've only just discovered this meter as a result of Anonominon doing it here. But that this 616 meter um, shows up in Matthew 25. And it's like, why, why is that time being measured? 616 is the number of years between Temple Down and the Lord Down. Okay, we would say Temple Down 586 B.C. The Lord died when he was 33, so you have to cut the four years off because of the Pharaoh era of four years and just call it 30 AD. You can't call it 33 and get the right measure. Okay? You have to, you have, because all of our, all of our calendars and counts between BC and AD use the Veronic chronology, which Augustus approved. Okay? And, and everybody knew there was a four year error in it, but Augustus approved it anyway, and that same four year error infects all of our calculations today. Okay, everybody thinks it's because the Catholics made a mistake, and they did make mistakes, but the mistake that still persists is Pharaoh. And all the Roman historians use the Veronic chronology. So you just have to count based on the errant four years. And since Christ is born at the end of the four years, it really ends up being a net three difference. 616 is the number of years from the time the first temple went down until the time Christ goes down. And somehow that's a significant measure because the same meter is used with and without the 14 in Matthew 25, and I don't know why. I, 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 I can say that it exists. I can tell you what it covers, but I don't know exactly why it's being used. 616 is also the number of syllables or years, which is 490 plus 70 plus 56. And you'll notice there's a 126 here, so somebody's playing on that. Luke is playing on that. I'm not sure why, but he's making a big point of the 21. So, and, and Matthew 25 makes a big play of the 21, because when it subtracts, based on a 616 meter, the total it's subtracting is 21. And I, I, I really want to understand why this is going on. Okay, so if you subtract 616 minus 21, you get 595, of course. Okay, and somehow that's significant. It, it's very significant in Matthew 25, and I haven't learned all the reason why yet. So he's saying, hi, yes, it's temple down quality again. See, here's the first, first of it. This is, the, this is the west, then it moves east, so it becomes the east, and this is what's left of the west, and it's going through its own bad time because of what's happening in the east. And there's some kind of recovery or there's some kind of growth due to all that trouble. Okay? So, then you have, you know, here the text being that, you know, there's all this trouble going on. All right? So, it fits the text. And it fits the time. Because this ends up being 646 A.D. There's some kind of recovery, though. Well, that recovery isn't happening in the East, so it has to be happening in the West. Where in the West? I don't know. You know, somewhere in the Gauls, somewhere in what we now call Britain, you know, because Colombo, Columba is somewhere in here. I forget exactly where, but he's somewhere in here. There was a lot of missionary activity going on. There were a lot of monks, a lot of monasteries, a lot of roving monks who called themselves missionaries from various and sundry subsects that called themselves Catholic, but they taught whatever they wanted. And they had little Bibles that they carried with them. 
and they would teach what was in those Bibles to the people. So there, there was growth, okay? In spite of the fact that, see, orge, anger, okay? Ter terrible tribulation that there will be, okay? On all the peoples of the world, okay? And I'm sure outside this particular focus of Europe, that it was happening in other places too, but I haven't checked that out yet. Okay, because see, when it says all the world, it's not just saying a section of the world. Okay, it's talking about the whole world. Okay, so there's going to be some kind of counterpart to this going on, but I don't know what it is yet. This is a poster boy. The poster boy is Europe, because what Christ is doing is tracing out the fulfillment of the Daniel 9 prophecy about the man of time. And the man of time has a specific geographic focus that moves successively west. Okay, it's called the King of the North in Daniel 11, but it moves successively west. So it's north, but it's west of Jerusalem. Okay. So by 646, there's some kind of positive attitude toward Bible. So there's growth. Not a whole lot, but enough to, you know, come into the land. See, because that was the original meaning of this 21. Is that, okay, you've served your time, and now you're ready to go to the home that I, I promised you. So there's some kind of movement going on here. And, you know, if I looked at history more, I could get more specific. But that's the second the second 126. Is there's a two timelines. East now and west because there were two Romes they split geographically and politically and then they ended up splitting theologically too and the theological split started happening right about was it 378 or so so you know just in here somewhere by 349 that would be 379 so right right in here Okay, because you have a theological split occurring here. And then there are more of them. They just keep on happening. All right. So by 616, there's something positive happening. And whatever that positive thing was, it really worked. Because by 707, which at 30, 737 AD, that's accorded with a 91. Now 737 AD um, is just after the Battle of Tours is just after Charles Martel defeated the Muslims, because the Muslims, of course, um, didn't just stay in Jerusalem in 638. They sort of swarmed all over the Levant, and then they swarmed northern Africa, and they swarmed up to Spain, and they were actually ruling in Spain. I forget if it was the, I think it was the Abbasids. It might have been the Umayyads. Um, and then they wanted to swarm into France, and they were stopped by Charles and Martel, Battle of Tours, 732. Okay? So, this text is going to characterize that period. Alright? I mean, I'm going to leave you to go look that up. Because I'm trying to just focus here on the numbers. Whatever that was, there was good, really good growth in Bible doctrine. And the Arabs were stopped. Okay? So that's a good period. That's what a good number looks like. 84 plus 7, see it's a 7 for the, you know, hardship, is 91. Okay? 91 is a big key number in Matthew 24. It's also a big key number in Paul. And of course, Luke and Paul were traveling together, and it stands for a quarter of a year that's now bringing in Noah. Okay? He's bringing in the whole concept of Noah when he uses that, 91. And I don't remember if his text, because Matthew 24 talks about Noah explicitly. Well, times of the Gentiles, that's your 666. Now we're going beyond that to 701. Um, I'm looking to see if I can see the word Noah in this text. I can't read it as fast as I can in English. Well, you got the Lassas, the sea, but that's not Noah, it's just an illusion. Uh, 
Okay, I don't see I don't see any allusion to Noah right there. Okay, but in any event, that's what the history is. And it was a good period of growth. Okay, well what was basically happening was that the Carolingians were were now replacing the Merovingians. And Martel, I want to say, was the grandfather of what will become Charlemagne. And Charlemagne is starting right about, well, a little bit before here. This, this would be 779, and I want to say Charlemagne started in 800 or 801. So this goes to 810. So it'd be sometime during the 31 years here. Okay, so if we say that was 779, then you have to count 21 syllables of the 31. So that's polis, doxis, kai, duna, meus, me. Right about here is Charlemagne's start. Okay, and I forget how long he lived. He lived a while. And what Charlemagne was kind of famous for, he was goofball too, but he was famous for really wanting everybody to get educated in Bible. He ordered some copies be made, not too many, but you know what? What they did is that the monks would have their master copies, and the people would go to those territories to get the instruction, or they would go to get copies, and then they would take copies out from those 50 copies. I think it was 50. That might have... I might be mixing him up with Constantine. But he did order copies of Bible be made. He wanted the, the territory that he ruled to get Bible instruction. Okay. Now, he did a lot of stupid things, but that was one of the good things. Okay, so that's why you got a 42 going on here, because, you know, people don't grow out of vacuums. Why was Charlemagne interested in scripture? Because he, he was born during this time. I want to say he was older when he comes to the throne, when they finally overthrow the, the Carolingian, the the Merovingians, and that's why. So you had a 21 here, and then a 91 here. That those are good report cards. Then you got 42 here. That's a very good report card. So that's the stage by 779. That's the stage set. Okay. Now, bear in mind that. Just because you're learning and living on Bible doesn't mean you suddenly stop saying you are a good person. It takes a long time for Bible thinking to replace your own. So if you started out as a savage, you're still a savage. Okay, it might take 20, 30 years before you know scripture enough to stop being a savage. And you never stop sinning. Okay, so when you look back on this period of history and say, well, bring up, these people were really nasty. Yeah, they were. But Bible is not measuring that. It's saying, did you want Bible or not? God keeps his word. And you can get it. And obviously people were getting it. But you don't magically change into a, whatever the fake idea of Christian is now. That you're nice and you're always working around the church and you're giving to people. That isn't how people lived then at all. And that's not how people live now either. The monks were rude. They were nasty. They were um, particularly cruel. And if they weren't cruel to each other, they were cruel to themselves. It, there was, there's just all kinds of horrible things that happened with the monks. But not all of them were like that. Okay? I mean, you used to have mo monks would run around like bandits. And they would take over a town. That was particularly prevalent in the 400s and to some extent in the 500s and 600s. And of course some monasteries really were peaceful and interested in learning and all the rest of it. But, you know, the Bible changes you but it doesn't change you overnight. And you have to really learn it. If you just memorized it, you'll still be the same cruel, nasty person you were before you even knew. And you might even be worse. So you got to bear in mind that those two trends are going on. Bible is saying that there were enough. Could have been one person. Could have been a hundred people. There were enough during that time period to call this a period of growth. 
And I'm kind of guessing that Charlemagne had something to do with it, but I really don't know. He's the titular head, and the Bible is counting this timeline. Timelines do go by the kings. But we have a bunch of kings at this point. There are a bunch of different nations that are starting to form. I mean, today's France and today's Germany was then split up in like 12 or 15 or 16 different polities at the time. Okay, plus you had a bunch of people overrunning from what we now call Russia that are sort of, you know, fooling in. Then you had people coming from the north of what we call, you know, Norway and Sweden and Denmark. And they were initially pirates too. And they were coming down and you had people running in from the east and you had people running in from the north and people running up from the south to get away from the Muslims. All right? So you have a huge confluence of people and a lot of breakups into like little kingdoms. You know, mostly maybe the size of New Jersey. Okay? But there was Bible interest enough to call that a 42. So 749 is the benchmark here. It stands for 779 AD. And you can go look that up to find out what might be important about it. But it has to be connected to the Bible. And when you see an increase in religifying, that is disinterest in Bible. When you see an increase, what you want to trace, and I've got a book that does that, what you want to trace is how many Bibles were made, how popular was it to make them, and how readable were they when they were made. And the book that I use to trace that out is a book by Christopher de Hamel, who uh, is in England, I think. And his book is called The Bible, and, and I paid like $50 for it at Amazon. It's a cocktail-sized book because it's got a lot of illustrations of what the Bible manuscripts look like. So trace that, okay? Because interest in Bible will be reflected in how many people wanted copies of the manuscripts. Were they just copies of the pretty things like the Psalms? Or were, you know, were they the whole books? Because you've got Codex Alexandrinus coming out here and a bunch of codex, codices that are coming out. The, the famous ones we have today started to come out. The big times when they came out was the 4th century, the, eight, the 7th and 8th century, and then the 11th century. And most of what we call the Bible today is mostly a product of the 11th century. Although the texts we have go all the way back to the 1st century. Okay. And the words that got preserved in later copies, as you can see, because of this precision with the meter, we really got the words that, that Luke wrote. Because nobody knows the meter. So they just copied the letters. They didn't, they didn't know. But Luke sure knew, because look how he's tracking the Matthew, okay? So at this point, we're now at 779. Now I've introduced Charlemagne. And I think I'm going to break off there for the time being. Be sure to play with the history of this time from 6, six literally 696, but 666 to 820, which is 850. And go look at Western European history. Because, see, we got really good growth here. 21, 91, 42 another 91, all the way up until 870 A.D., because that's 840 plus 30, and then compare it to the text, okay? And even if you don't know the Greek, you can count syllables. You know, you can get uh, the Word software or eSword for free, and they have the Greek text, and you can count the syllables, and see how the satire is on the period of history you're studying. That's why I'm doing this, to show the methodology. Peace out.